Bonjour, James here. Welcome to another edition of Cafe de Rene. I'm joined once again by the Star Show, Mr. Rene Pre and Rene. A friend of the show has returned. <laughs> yes, the greatest guest in the history of guests has returned because he's my oh. friend. And uh, <laughs> yes, he's going to join us for the topics, the topic edition of uh, Cafe de Rene. And James, what are me and Paul going to be discussing today? Oh, do you like skateboarding? Okay, that's the worst yeah. impression I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, what are you doing? What the fuck? You can't go be smoking <sighs> blood backstage. You look like you're on Valium. Maybe you need to just take a couple weeks off. Don't worry about your job. But just, you might want to take some time. You look like you're on Valium. Get out of here. Fuck you. you tell you that, really? Don't need yeah. everyone. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, All right, so we're talking about Johnny Laryngitis. Yeah, well, <laughs> thanks for voting for everyone. And uh, before we carry on, please hit that subscribe button, like, uh, get the views up in the audience, and yeah, we'll carry on. So, uh, ask one of you first. When's the first time you met Johnny Ace? Was it in WWE, or did you have much awareness of him beforehand? I actually met him at. Yeah, I actually met him at WCW. Um, not to age myself too much, but he was, uh, if I remember correctly, he was head of talent at WCW, very same kind of position. He was in uh, WWE and Dory Funk Jr. had arranged for myself and a few of the other uh, standouts of the Funkin' Conservatorium, if you can say that, um, to do some backstage stuff. And um you know, I didn't, when you're that new and you're kind of wide-eyed in the back of a, a big company's locker room for the first few times, you're, it, you don't really allow yourself to become too opinionated um, because you're just kind of paranoid about pissing anybody off. So, uh, but he didn't, he didn't really seem to change too much from when I started working with him. At WWE, I mean, um, he always uh, he always kind of struck me as like that that dad who used to be an athlete, but um, is now like his kid's coach. But he talks a lot of shit, and he 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 acts like a very much like a been there, done that kind of guy. And I mean, to his credit, I mean he he was there during. A lot of the peak times, you know, with like uh, dynamic dudes and whatnot, even though I always thought Shane Douglas was the better worker of the two. Um, and I never really delved into any of his stuff in Japan. Um, but, you know, I can't say that he ever kind of pissed me off directly uh, face to face. I mean, he's not the kind of guy to to really deal with you face to face. Um, so I guess that kind of says something about him, but, um, but, you know, there's certain people you can tell just talk a bigger game than what ends up being the truth. And so you, you start questioning the validity of, and the integrity of some of these people. And when they're in charge of, talent um that's not always a good thing you know so you know his voice never changed i'll tell you that i don't know why his voice is like that you want me to tell you <laughs> why his voice is like that i would love to dr death they had a match in japan right and dr death <laughs> used to do this like thing where he jump up and get you in the throat and he tore his like uh larynx is that what it's called right the voice box yeah so that's laryngitis why yeah <laughs> yeah uh, it's interesting too because like his his brother joe you know animal from legion of doom road warriors um pretty pretty opposite in my opinion from my working with joe was like very cool cool guy straight up i'm not saying johnny h was like a prick or anything but you just you felt 
like he would be telling you one thing and in his head he was already kind of devising what he was really going to do um i don't know i guess you could just kind of see the bullshit uh in between his eyes but but i always thought joe was awesome like i always thought is you know and maybe that's just because he he got to kind of that megastar level and i don't know that johnny ace ever did you know i mean you hear all the stories about how the only reason johnny got into the business is because he did the whole corporate thing right he was like into that whatever and his brother joe said yeah i made over half a million dollars this year and that's the only reason why johnny got into the business makes sense right because i think he was working for a sunny bray or some shit one of those corporations <laughs> what the yeah yeah and then uh no no road warrior got him i think in the awa where he was a flag bearer he held the flag for the sheep herders right and then <laughs> Yeah, and then his brother went to WCW, so that's when Johnny became a dynamic dude. And then when that fucking shit the bed, he went over to Japan because his brother got him in there as well, right? And a story I heard was that he was so bad that Baba said, I'm cutting your pay in half, and you have to train with the young boys because you suck. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, See, that, I always heard that story about him like banging Baba's wife or something. No, 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 no. Here's the deal why he got so much power in Japan. Number one, all the other foreign talent, they were all getting hired by the American companies, right? Nobody wanted right. Johnny. So then by default, I guess, he started to gain more seniority, right? Because guys like uh, Phil Lafon and Danny Crawford, uh, Danny Crawford and um, uh, Doug Furness, they got hired by WWF. Dean, Dean Malenko and, and all those other guys, they were going to WCW, right? So the reason why he stayed there so long is because he hooked up Baba with a T-shirt deal. What he would do is he'd get the T-shirts for Baba made in the United States, and then he had all the American talent fly through LAX with fucking duffel bags full of T-shirts. <laughs> yeah. So it's a smart business, you know, on his part. But at the same time, you know, okay, this is my connection to make us money. And then they realize, okay, they, you know, because he is smart and he is college educated, right? Right. But you know who he stole all his finishes from? Was it the Ace Crusher? I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Guys would be sitting watching the matches and they'd be like, Johnny just stole my move. He just stole my move. He just stole my move. He'd steal everybody else's shit. I guarantee the Ace Crusher, it was probably one of the Japanese boys that came up with it. Guarantee it. So he That's wasn't... the RKO for all you people in this day and age. What's his... Obviously, you've been going to Japan for the past 15 years, Renee. So what's his reputation over there now? Is, this, is he highly regarded or what's, what's it like? Uh... All the boys hated him. <laughs> yeah. No, all the boys couldn't fucking stand him. Uh, guys like Gary Albright wanted to kill him. Uh, Phil Fon hated him because he stole all his shit. Uh, yeah, but the office liked him because he was smart. Right. Right. And he is a smart guy. But he was never one of the boys in the locker room. I mean, I'm sure he would say different, right? I mean, that's it, you tell me. I mean, what the fuck were they? Uh, I'm, one of the boys. I'm one of you guys. Come on, I, just because I suck dick on the side doesn't mean I'm uh, someone you can't trust. Come on, guys. Yeah, he. I don't. Yeah. No, 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 dude. It's been proven. He's going through a little bit of a pickle right now. I, I don't know if you heard the news. Um, the I his cover ups or something. Oh geez, and the stories that I know that I'm not going to say publicly because I could get in trouble. Dude, that's just <laughs> like the fucking tiny little tit of the iceberg. Dude, the shit that I know of. So imagine how much yeah. other shit there's out there. Yeah. 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 Did you? Have so I mean, story. Oh, go yeah. ahead. So. Someone said someone saw dynamic dudes. I think it was Douglas and um, Ace, and that there was pro- there was apparently 
hugging romantically and someone took a picture. They got angry about it. They grabbed the camera and tried to smash it, but I think the guy got away with it. Okay, and where is this said picture? I'll try and splice it in. Oh, God. <laughs> so they were hugging like a rip, like a joke, like, oh, we're buddy buddies, and then they took a picture, and okay. Is yeah. that where, is, I heard a, a cornet story where they were in Philadelphia and the whole crowd was chanting, Johnny sucks Shane's dick. God. No smoke without fire. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God! That's... Oh, poor, poor yeah. Shane, man. I mean, I always liked Shane Douglas. I always thought he was a solid worker, and in ECW, I thought he was amazing as a heel. Really, kind of carried that company for a while. Right, but no, Johnny you know, was always Johnny was always a pain in my ass, man. Like threatening to fire me every other week. I can fire you today. I can fire you today. And then the next week he'd be cool, and then the next week yeah. he'd be prick. So it's like, I just got so sick of fucking even looking at the guy. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, just a master manipulator. I think that's uh, unfortunately what you think of when you think of like talent relations is just somebody who continuously throws these kind of, I don't know if they're empty threats, but just it's it's a power game, you know, and I'm not exactly sure who's in charge of talent up there now. Um, but Apparently it's you Bruce know. Pritchard. Is that your buddy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a fellow good, Texan. Good on, I'm more of a I'm I'm of the Tom Pritchard camp. Uh more so. That's right. I like Tom. That's uh, who initially hired me was Tom oh, Pritchard. Really? Yeah. Okay. So and uh, Bruce wasn't really all that cool to me until he was gone from there as well. And we had interacted on a few independent shows or something. And he was cool to me all of a sudden, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Fucking brother love, man. I don't know. You know, it's, I, uh, love you. Uh, I remember even as a kid, that would annoy the fuck out of me. Yeah. Like, to the point where I want to change the channel. <laughs> yeah, brutal. He had the, yeah. the go away heat before anybody, huh? Yeah, <laughs> Jesus Christ is annoying. But yeah, well, he had Johnny, like, huh? Oh, I was just gonna say, Bruce put out this. He he did some interview with um, Jeff Jarrett's guy, Connor Con Man Thompson. Um, yeah, and good year blimp. Yeah, okay. And like Bruce just i don't know where he came up with this shit but he um conrad's you know he's he's always been cool to me and he was very complimentary in my work and so he he brought me up out of the blue it was really random and bruce went on this like spiel about how i had all the tools in the world and i i was ready i i could have been anything i wanted to in the company and they gave me every opportunity and all just all this stuff. And I was like, that's fucking that's news to me, you know. Um, and that I just that I was aloof, that was the word he used, and that I was disinterested. And it just kind of painted me out as this guy who uh didn't give a shit about being there. And and I just thought, like, what a fucking prick, you know, because it's one thing to genuinely be disinterested, but it's another thing when it's almost like, you know, don't confuse my lack of enthusiasm for being a kiss ass and wanting to be a part of this little inner circle of jerk offs um, as me not caring. It's just that, you know, I'm not going to go home and look in the mirror and hate who I am because I sucked up to a bunch of people I just genuinely didn't respect, you know, and so, but he painted it as me being disinterested and not caring and all this stuff. And it's like, if anything, I, I cared too much, you know? And I think that's, that was something that when you're young and you're trying to be the best you can and, and you don't know any better, you know, you go into this situation kind of naive, you know, cause I'm sure you, you know, I don't know if you had a similar situation, but I remember whenever I would go up there to do tryouts and dorks and stuff, 
um, I remember specifically Crash Holly, who was super cool, uh, always, he'd be like, why do you want to work here? I'm sitting there like, what? Like, this is, this is heaven's gate. Like, who wouldn't want to work here? You know, this is, this is the promised land. And I couldn't understand why all these guys hated it. Um, and, you know, obviously it's not until you get up there and you're really into that muck of mind games and lies and manipulation and bullshit and, you know, double standards and blah, 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 blah. That you're just kind of like, man, like it, it doesn't, it shouldn't be this way. You know, it should be like, ideally everybody should be getting a slice of the pie because everybody's contributing, whether it's a thinner slice or a bigger slice, everybody who's on the show or appears on any of the shows. And this goes for any company. I don't care if you're on, you know, the weekend shows, the internet shows, the national shows, if you are being, shown at all then you should be treated in my opinion with the equal amount of respect as the guys who are shoved down people's throats now i get it that's kind of an idealist mentality but um but that's what leads to a lot of um just infighting and 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 obviously it's entertainment i get it and it's show business not show friends and all that kind of nonsense but you know when you don't know any better, you like to think that, oh my God, this is like, how is everyone not getting along? Everyone's making money and traveling. But, you know, when you look at it at its core of being kind of this, this hillbilly-esque carny bread um, industry, you know, you know, as well as I do, you put a lot of money in people's pockets and they can change pretty quickly. And a lot of this shit can go to people's heads. And then like, you you know, back to Johnny, did he ever like try to like tell you how much power he had? Um, not directly, but I'll give you an example. We were in Australia and, uh, it was the last, show of a tour and i was in a mixed tag and i had done some i had called some sort of i don't even know what it was it was like a cannonball leg drop or something and i ended up accidentally sitting on shane helm's face and this wasn't when he was hurricane he was like gregory helms or something at the time yeah but i i broke his nose and Dang. complete accident yeah and i was like and, and he like tried like i mean i don't blame him he was pissed and he was like trying to like shoot on me or something which i started kind of laughing because i was like what the fuck is this you um, know and i got to the back and funny enough like guys like jbl and i mean they were like hey don't worry about it like it happens like they were consoling me which i thought was really bizarre i mean i always had kind of a an odd uh, mutual respect with jbl after a certain period a lot of people think that he was like just a non-stop bully to to guys in my position and whatnot and it wasn't i mean for him specifically it was like when i first got there that you know i think they're testing out the new guys in the locker room and they're fucking with them and they're prodding them and trying to incite them and stuff like that but once you kind of get through that and for whatever reason you might earn their respect i just kind of always maintained that and um so anyways i remember jbl was like the guy who was like ah, don't worry about it you know if anything you probably made him better looking and blah 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 but i still felt really bad about it yeah to where i got back to the states and i remember buying all this green stuff like i don't even remember what all just nonsense and i sent this care package to gregory helms as like an apology and he was like i don't know what you sent me like gummy rats and like a flute and all this like candy and stuff like that and he was like i was looking for like the pills and stuff and i was like well i'm not gonna send you a bunch of that's not my scene right but either way i i had sent him an apology well anyways that same week when we got back I had, I had received voicemails from 
several people in the office who normally were really kind and polite. Um, and they were very uh, cold. They were like, Paul, this is so-and-so I can't even remember. Um, you need to call Johnny Ace right now. He's expecting your call, call him immediately. And then I got another call from, um, I want to say, um, God, his, his um, what's his name? Uh, the ring announcer. Um, Hello, Jimmel? No, it wasn't Chimmel. Oh, it's Howard the, Finkel. Finkel, yeah. And like, and he was very, same thing, very cold. He was like, Paul, this is Howard. You need to call Johnny Ace immediately. And like hung up and I was just like, oh, fuck, like I'm fired. Okay, this is this. I guess I'm fired for for the this thing that happened in Australia. And they and I'm not kidding you. I must have received eight to ten voicemails like that um, because you know anytime you receive the unavailable number, you wouldn't answer it. It's like leave a voicemail if it's that important. But I'm not picking right. that up because I know that's the office. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so you know I had all these voicemails. And I'm sitting there going through like, you know, a pound of weed at the time, just getting more paranoid. Like, ah, that's it. I'm done. I'm fired. Like, all right, I'm fired. Fuck, I'm fired. So when I finally was like, well, time to face the music. I called Johnny Ace. He was like super nice. and was like, oh, just wanted to resign you. Same amount. No big deal. And I felt like, and I was like, oh yeah. Like I was so, they had, and I'm not kidding you. Like I, truly think this is a strategic technique that they used because like i said all these people who left me voicemails were always super polite and kind and friendly but all these voicemails were so cold and short and they were all saying the same thing like you need to speak to johnny ace immediately like call him now ah, i was just like jesus christ so that by the time i called him i was already in such a kind of defensive kind of beaten down state thinking like okay well here goes my job uh, right. time to face the music that it when they were like we just want to re-sign you same amount I well, would the be same so, amount. yeah i would be so relieved that i wouldn't even be in the mindset to try and negotiate, negotiate. better for myself yeah right and so that was like a super telling uh manipulative tactic that i'll never forget because it was just like oh god damn it like they well, got me. my story <laughs> yeah. Oh, similar, but not about money. Okay, listen to this. So every week, Johnny would be like, Renee, I got enough power to fire you. I got enough power to fire you. Right? And then I ended up in rehab, right? The first one. I actually escaped that rehab. I got kicked out, but I signed a non disclosure or whatever. So, like, if the office called, they, they weren't supposed to tell them where I was. So basically, I could have left and waited the 30 days and said yeah i finished the rehab they would have never known but me being me i actually i was living in houston at the time so i went from tennessee i got to texarkana and finally i called johnny told him that i fucking got kicked out what the fuck Renee? you're gonna get fired so right there <laughs> is when i realized oh so you really can't fire i mean you could fire me but i'm on this special little list that vince and Pat Patterson, especially, don't want to get fired. Remember the time he fired the boogeyman in the morning and then Boogie was hired with like a raise in the afternoon? Remember that? <laughs> no. Oh, you don't know about that? Oh, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because uh, Vince loved Boogie, right? Because right. His body. Yeah, because Boogie's yeah, a I, crazy bodybuilder guy. Because he and ate worms. Yeah, but fucking Johnny hated him because he didn't know how to wrestle. So he always had it out for Boogie. So then Johnny thought he had enough power to be able to fire Boogie. But as soon as it was like at nine o'clock in the morning, as soon as Vince found out that Boogie was fired at three o'clock in the afternoon, he had his job back with a race. Oh my God. And that's some wow. shit. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I remember Johnny being responsible for your one of your former teammates, Kenzo getting like a $250,000 deal a year and his wife, like they each had a $250,000 case. Those were two people that Johnny was responsible for bringing in. At least that was the story I always got. And it was like, you know, I, I liked Kenzo a lot, but like the guy couldn't tie his shoes. 
And I just they had an apartment in Manhattan, which was like three thousand dollars a month, like this yeah. one bedroom apartment. Yeah, but I mean, then move, you know. But like to to pay this these guy, the guy and his wife. I mean, his wife was making more than half the boys. You know? More than me. Me too. <laughs> and it was just like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, you know, it, it, I would think back to why I crash when some of these guys were so disgruntled and kind of pissed off all the time. I was like, ah, oh, now it kind of makes sense, you know? Like, well, dude, it's like when they had that million dollar tough enough. How bad did that fuck up them around the locker room when they find out this guy like Daniel Pubert is going to make a quarter of a million dollars when they're lucky to make half before taxes? <sighs> That's pretty bad. I, yeah, it's bad for, it wrong. Very bad for morale. Yeah. I mean, I blame all that tough enough stuff on like big. I don't know who that I still don't know who that was. Oh, or how he I ever got in that position. Week. Yeah, he's a fucking J Brown. I call him. Yeah, and I, Vader. I never met him. That's an insult to Vader. Um <laughs> but but I never but you know, and I I got along with a lot of those tough enough guys. Like they were, I didn't think anything of it, but it was also like, well, they're, they're instantly getting brought into a push, like a situation where they're getting pushed. Um, but they just, they were kind of in a different hemisphere than where I was. <laughs> I think so maybe like on a personal level, you could probably get along with them because a lot of them were nice guys, but from a business standpoint, it's like, why the fuck are you here? Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's somewhere there's pics of me and Jimmy Yang hanging out with Miz in Nashville in our hotel room, like just hanging out and partying it up. And this was like right as Miz got there. Um, and he was, you know, seemingly cool. But I mean, you think back on it, it's like, okay, we we were probably just the only guys who weren't treating him like absolute shit, right. you know. So I, um, I, I just I used just to party with his wife. Hey, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's that's for another episode, right? Yeah, <laughs> please tell the story about ten episodes. <laughs> that's where the Fifi character came from. <laughs> uh, yeah, something that's fantastic. Johnny Ace, he was known for signing a lot of divas from basically uh, fitness magazines. Who were some of the yeah. names he actually signed to you knew personally? Barbie. Yeah. Kelly Kelly. Okay. I used to call her Smelly Kelly. <laughs> and, and then uh, Alicia, Alicia Fox. Foxy Foxy. She came from a catalog. Right. What was that? Was it Amy Weber? Remember that? I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. Was... You remember yeah. what happened there in Tokyo? Yes. You and I were hanging out together uh, in Rapunki. Is that when what you went... Fridays? No, that was uh, no, that was back in Chicago during Mania when I ruined you your know, bathtub. You threw, up, you, you threw up at the Fridays in Rapunki. No. Dude. Yes, no. you did. You were drunk. No. Dude, I mean, I'm yes. not denying that, but I don't remember. I mean, I might have. I don't fucking remember. Dude, you were like blacked up. We had to drag you out of there. Yeah, folks. No. We, we no. <laughs> no, I remember. Guys. I remember. No, I, I really don't remember because I didn't. I didn't usually get that drunk, um, oh, unless I had a. Bit, I mean, I'm not denying it, but I just remember us being downtown and we ran into like Randy and Batista and Shane and they were with uh, Christy Hemi. I think it was you, me and uh, Mark Muhammad Hassan. And I think we were all going around Rapungi and we ran into that group of guys and they had Christy Hemi who she was blackout drunk. And they were like, you need to take her back to the hotel room. And it was like, what? Like, we have to kind of end our night to take her back. And I think we ended up putting her like in the wrong room or something. I don't even remember. Um, but going back to the Amy Weber story, I think that was when we were at catering. And I think the Bashams and uh, JBL or something, they were out. I mean, everyone was out in their separate groups going to all the clubs and stuff. And in Rapungi, you know, you had all those Jamaicans and stuff and they'd be handing you Nigerians. Yeah, Nigerians, the flyers. Oh, the Nigerians. 
they, what they would do is they take like Tori Wilson was on one of the cards to go like come to my club, come to my club, strip club, right? Yeah. And yeah. Hand up, and the, Tori Wilson was on a woman, and this Amy Weber girl was on Hostess the card. Hostess bars. Hostess bars or strip clubs, right? So then yeah. they took that to, to Bradshaw. Bradshaw didn't like this girl for some reason, probably because he proposed or hit on her and he, she rejected him more than likely. And uh, so that started this big thing to where they got to Stephanie to where they said that this girl was a stripper back in the day, which wasn't true at all. I think she was a model, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so she had done like some soft core movies or something like Skinamax stuff or something. But, well, like yeah, Candace Michelle did the same thing, right? Hell yeah. Right. Look at James all excited. Yeah, but they knew of that <laughs> before they hired her, right? So... Yeah, see, that's the thing. Once you got heat with one of the top guys there, they're going to find any little fucking thing they can just to bury you, right? Well, so that cost that was her a job. I think she ended up getting fired because of that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember they would always say, like, if she would have just owned up to it and been like, yeah, that was me, I got a few of my kids, and she would have been over with the boys. And so it's like, there's so many of those kind of, mind games that get played um but you know i think a, an issue with them hiring you know they were going through this big diva phase was that you know you're hiring models or amateur models or whatever and they're only maybe seeing a few moments of developmental if that and it's just not enough time to really recondition these people into a sense of know-how and etiquette and that kind of stuff and so i know something that pissed a lot of the boys off was that you know sometimes even though we were on some of these charter flights from the states over to europe you know it's still like an eight to ten hour flight a few of us would have to um share rows or like you know sit in, you know sit in the middle and this and Whereas a lot of these divas would confiscate an entire row to themselves. And so they could yeah. lay down and then they would put like blankets that create like tents over the aisle. So they block themselves off from everybody. Was that Christy Hemi did that? Or was that Amy yeah. Weber? Yeah. yeah. It was Christy Hemi. It was definitely, yeah, it was definitely Christy Hemi. Cause I remember I'd be sitting with Christian and he, you know, we grabbing like oranges and different fruits and like throwing them and like knocking down these tents that they were trying to get their beauty sleep in and shit. And they were getting all pissed off. And I was like, right. we're the ones taking the goddamn bumps here. Like, what are y'all right. doing? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. are you yeah. kidding? So it was just shit like that. For fuck's sakes. Yeah. I, I mean, seriously. Yeah. So, you know, that would rub a lot of the guys wrong. Just, you know, so that's the issue with hiring a lot of these these models and doing this diva search kind of stuff. And, you know, occasionally you'd get one that would come around and start to develop a good mindset. Like, I mean, Candice Michelle's a great example. Like, she ended up becoming, you know, pretty solid worker for them for a while, like towards the end of her run. Um, and then, event, you know, eventually was considered like really part of the locker room and whatnot. So she was... She was kind of a rare exception. Um, obviously, Ashley was another exception. Um, even though physically she shouldn't have probably done a lot of the things that she did that they put her up to Dude, doing. She, did she even weigh 100 pounds? She was tiny. If that. Yeah, if that, you know. Dude, and I don't know so, if you're comfortable getting into it. Uh, if you, you Stop me right here if you don't. But I mean, because you two had a relationship. I remember you guys dated for... Was it six months, something like that? Yeah, it was quite a bit, on and off. A so, little over a year. Are you comfortable talking about her ending, man? Because that was, that was, oof. that took um, me by, by shock. Took me by, by surprise, too. I had received a, um, a message from a friend of mine in England who was, he just said, I'm so sorry about Ashley. And I was like, what? Like, I don't know what's going on. And that's when I found out and uh, just, um, yeah, very, very upsetting and, and, a, and a very sad ending for her because um, at her core, just, you know, genuinely a very 
friendly and bright and, and sweet person who everyone for the most part got along with in a locker room. You know, I think just on the, on the, on the peripheral, you know, you would catch wind that a lot of these, you know, there's a thing like with, especially with like the divas, it wasn't that different than some of the boys where, you know, they'd baby face each other face to face, but then they would talk shit about each other. Oh, with the and women? They're, and they're, oh, yeah. Oh, it's even you know. worse than the men. Worse, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, especially if they're getting pushed and they're in this position and so-and-so likes them and, like, the That's opposite. That's when the rumors start, yeah. right? Oh, he's sleeping with, she's sleeping with this guy. Right. And sometimes right, they're right. right. That does happen. Right. Right. But I do remember specifically many times when she would, she would be crying to me because Vince was propositioning her to, to fly on the jet with them. Like Kevin Dunn, Bucktooth Bucky would be uh, telling her that she has to fly on the jet with them or that he might, you know, possibly, or every now and then if she was at the, you know, they'd always put the divas up at like the TV hotel or whatever, you know, he'd be knocking on her door and, you know, trying to get her to answer. And it's just like, I'm shocked this Vince stuff is just now coming out. I mean, it, you know, I haven't looked up on a lot of it and like, oh, I want to get the details because I just would rather not. But I'm surprised it hasn't come out within the last 10 years. Um, but that just goes to show how afraid people are of that power dynamic where they're so fearful of losing their job or. You know, it's like, what does that say about you if you're protecting this 90-year-old fucking corpse uh, with a thong tan, tan line um, just because he's a billionaire? You know, I mean, it's, like I said, money changes people. Just, hope, just hoping they get that Legends contract and that money. Yeah. The useless Hall of Fame position. Which ain't um, worth a shit. Yeah. <laughs> right? It ain't worth the shit. Was Johnny Ace like married to the Bella's mom or something? Or Dude. so get this, right? They did the time. Let's bring it back to Johnny. Here. Let's bring it back Let's bring to Johnny. It back to the topic of the at hand here. So okay, so there Vince was was banging this like 40-year-old paralegal that he met in his fucking uh condo condominium right so he hires her she doesn't even have like the credentials to be a paralegal you know so then he gets tired of her gives her a position to be johnny ace's assistant and apparently johnny's having fucking sexual relations with her at the same time that his wife who's the bella twins mother is going through brain cancer fucking while Didn't while he's married to the Bella's mom, yes. Oh. And dude, if I could tell you, I'll tell you off 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 camera. Sure. Let's just say it's be, it'd be very awkward to be sitting at that table. The things I know oh about that family, especially Big Johnny. Oh my god! Uh, and I I heard it from a very reliable source. I'm not naming names, but damn. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, just a detestable human being, absolutely detestable human being. Yeah, yeah. But here's the, here's the fucked up part. People are gonna think, oh, well, they're bitter, they're bitter, dude. Listen, if you people understood the fucking low life pieces of dog shit that work there, and those are the ones that you have to kiss ass to and try to be like, because you know you gotta fucking get along with the higher ups. And what do higher ones? They want people to be just like them. I cannot be like that. I wasn't no. raised like that. I don't want to become. That's why. Like that. That's why I was aloof and disinterested. Yeah, fuck you, bro. Right, right. Yeah, that's why I was a fucking uh, not very sociable. No, I didn't want to socialize with you pieces of shit. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you made your choice. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> just you know, it's funny like... because, because like towards towards the, like i would say like within the last year or two um of my time there i remember specifically having a 
a sit down with Johnny where I had presented this idea to him. And I said, listen, like I have this idea and this was kind of early on with WWE studios. Um, I'm trying to think maybe, uh, you know, that had like seen no evil and condemned and Marine and maybe 12 rounds or something. I'm not sure they didn't, you know, less than 10 pictures. Mm. And, uh, I said, I have this idea. Why don't, on the company's dime, send me to film school. Let me start learning the ins and outs of the production business. And I can become an in-house writer to develop these screenplays. But the thing is, let's put more than one guy let's not just make it where it's like a tent pole project for one guy because then you're really kind of putting all your all your you know uh marbles in one basket you really are so i said why don't you know i was like we could have funaki as like a hot dog vendor in one scene you know i mean use as many guys as you can just whether it's like an under five part where they just have a few lines or or whatever but you can then start to slowly get more than just one person over um using this cinematic platform that you guys are really starting to to get through to um and he hated the he was like that that right there just tells me like you don't you don't want to do this you don't have the heart to wrestle blah 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 blah. i was like i'm looking at the big picture jackass like i'm trying to think of ways for you guys to to get more people over at the same time and to generate you know more money for everybody um and to make these films you know more interesting by adding more colors to them by adding more people in the locker room and he's like that's a terrible idea and no one's ever going to go for that and blah 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 and then you know you fast forward however many years later and you know that's that's what they ended up doing with like different movies where they have guys just in smaller parts and they have more than one guy in a movie and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying like that was my idea, but just that was one of those, we just could never really see eye to eye, um, you know, and yeah, I don't, whatever, you know, it's not for everybody. He, he's the one guy that rips off ideas from everybody and likes to take credit for it. In his own delusional mind, he probably convinces himself that it was his idea. Maybe. Maybe. Um, So, you know, yeah. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, Paul. A thief. If I fucking take 50 bucks out of your wallet, I'm a thief, right? Okay. What if I steal your idea and make millions of dollars off of it? it's like plagiarism right i mean it's kind of uh, that's a thief you know what i mean um yeah i mean that's that's a big deal you know guys get trademarks and copyrights for that very reason right because otherwise they get fucked like i guess i should have yeah. copyrighted the name dupree because it seems like uh they want to use that to try to generate money off of Oh, by the way, Paul. Yeah. With that being said, we have a special announcement. Uh oh. Starting next week, it will be Renee and Paul's wrestling review, or is it London and France, or is it London and Dupree? What, what, what are we calling it? <laughs> Maybe the name will kind of organically develop. Organically itself. grow. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. So here's our special announcement. Myself and one of the, my best friends in the wrestling world ever. Uh, we're going to join forces again because I think between he and I, uh, we know a thing or two about wrestling. I mean, we know how to lock up. Which is <laughs> more than 75% of the fucking talent these days. So, <sighs> yeah. So we'll be doing our wrestling <laughs> reviews, man. We're just going to be bluntly honest. If it's good, we'll say it's good. Right, Paul? Yeah, I think that's the challenge. It's like, I really hope, you know, for quite a while, I haven't been watching wrestling just because in the times that I would, um, it would be frustrating to watch, you know, because you would think 
this isn't um, as I'm not going to say complicated because I'm not saying it's easy. It's definitely not easy. But I think in terms of storytelling and psychology, it either makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And so much of what we see now doesn't make sense. And so, you know, I think the aim is that we can kind of help kind of condition the mindset to, to, to look for things that do or don't make sense. And it's not so much a point of let's just find all the fuck ups and everything that's wrong with the business. Um, but let's, let's, let's try and highlight the good um, while also bringing attention to the not so good and why. This is you going know. to be the best dynamic ever because Paul is going to give you a very intelli intelligent, artistic, articulate answer. <laughs> and I'm going to say, you fucking suck. <laughs> so it's going to be like good cop yang, yang. or rad cop. Okay, that's it. <laughs> uh okay so we're going to go back to talking about johnny ace i mean okay he's a jerk off he's pigeon toed uh, uh i don't really care for the guy is he out of a job let's hope so he should be you know he, i think this, like i mean what happens to that company when they clear house completely because you know there's a lot of residual um on the guys that are still there in terms of like the bruce pritchers and blah 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 you know it's like do you basically wipe the whole slate clean and and replace them with because that the because you know the risk is you start replacing these people with again corporate types hollywood types um people that didn't come up in the wrestling business and that that starts to become part of the reason why the business morphs and changes and really becomes something very different than what we all grew up loving you know yeah. Yeah. and i'm not saying like oh it needs to have like the hazing locker rooms and the territorial dynamic of you know weeding people out and stuff like that um but i think um it, it still needs to kind of maintain its integrity you know i've heard this this talk of the show going back to what pg-14 yeah you know and i mean what does that, that mean I, I was like what is that good is that really that risky so be able to say ass and shit Ooh. i exactly i you know it's like oh here the attitude error is coming back it's like i don't i don't think so i mean I that would be that would be refreshing in a lot of ways but um it's like it's like a PG-13 horror film, you know, it's, it's, it's very rare to, to make a PG-13 horror film that I think is any good. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done, you know, I think Drag Me to Hell is a prime example of a very good PG-13 horror film. I mean, they're out there, but a lot of times if I see a horror film coming out and it's PG-13, I likely, I'm like, nah, I'll pass on that. So right. they're going one one number more and going PG fourteen. Oh, stop boy. the press! <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? I don't know. And what when what catapulted 14, that? I mean, I was fucking Billy Badass. I was stealing beer <laughs> in my dad's fridge. Maybe that'll be the storylines that that we can look right? forward to seeing is uh, right. beer theft. And, yeah, uh, I used to try to download <laughs> porno clips, and it took me fucking half a day to get a minute clip <laughs> on the yeah, dial I would just <laughs> see James I would just watch the, I would just watch the scramble vision poor right. preview as I called it yeah oh yeah. no it's a boot <laughs> is that a nipple no that's a fucking testicle no come on <laughs> uh. <laughs> all right man James, we got anything else about Johnny? We all know he's, uh, you know, he's uh, Johnny Ace. He, he doesn't. I will say this: I, I, I do have another Johnny Ace uh, back. Okay, so a lot of people always bring up the limo explosion and the smiling and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. And um, so, 
it was in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And, you know, the, one of the, the side effects, the unfortunate side effects of um, when I was in a relationship with Ashley was that, you know, she had this ex-boyfriend who um, thought that he owned her. And so uh, couldn't, couldn't uh, deal with the fact that she wasn't with him anymore or whatever. And basically tried to sabotage my career by leaking out. Um, and this all happened the morning of that limo explosion. So we're in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We get to the building. None of us have any idea that this limo thing is going on later. But what people may not know is that I was in hot water before even any of that limo stuff, just by stepping into the building, I was in hot water already. Johnny, I mean, uh, with my bags and everything, I didn't even make it to the locker room. He calls me into a side office. And he's like, what, what did you say to a fan? I'm like, that we can take a picture? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, well, apparently it's all over the internet, dude. You leaked to some fan that Ashley was doing Playboy and Vince is furious, furious. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I didn't tell anybody that, you know? And, um, and Ashley was right there. She was vouching for me. She was like, he didn't, you know what I mean? Like, I can tell you firsthand, he didn't tell any fans anything um, because it, was, it wasn't announced yet, you know, that she was going to be doing the spread. And it was her ex-boyfriend who had told one of his uh, hillbilly lackeys to devise this, this story that I had just willingly told some fan at the airport, all this stuff. And so it got out online. And I said, listen, Johnny, like, you know, you know who did this. You know. And he goes, okay, yeah, like I do. I do. I know who it is. But I still have to pretend that I'm telling you because Vince, he's furious. He's furious. I'm like, well, then why don't I go talk to him? Because no, 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 no. I'll tell him that we talked, that I reprimanded you. It's water under the bridge. It's like, yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Right. So I was already in hot water for something that I didn't even have anything to do with. Um, so the person that, that whole speak thing. of who is, uh, whose brother is really famous. Um, <laughs> he, <laughs> he's bow-legged. He looks like a possum. <laughs> I think he has spray on hair. Um, not, a not, a bigger, not, a, not, a, not a bigger mark for himself. Oh, she's horrendous. Oh, it's, it's she's great. horrendous. Um, uh, I, just, I never... I never does she have a mouth on her? She, you know, or she likes to yap. Is that true? An absolute ghoul. An uh, absolute ghoul. Okay. I did uh, this short-lived company called Lucha Libre USA. And Is I had yours? taken over. I mean, it's not my company, but it was wow. a company I worked with. Oh, okay, I, had okay. take, I, had, I, I worked with Jindrak there. Oh, and, sweet. Uh, yeah, he was like the main main baby face. Right. And I got hired on to replace uh, TJ Perkins, who's a buddy of mine. And he was doing a character under a hood called Sadistico. So he ditched that position and left. And so they needed someone to step in for that character. And that's where I stepped in. And I was under a hood. And I mostly worked with Jindrak. I, I loved it because it was so easy and so fun to play heel and just bump around right. for this guy. Right. But she was their prize jewel female. Um, couldn't run the ropes, couldn't do anything. But similar to what I had mentioned earlier, would always set up her own little tent in the backstage of the casino because we worked in... Uh, Albuquerque at the Hard Rock Casino. She would set up her own little locker room in her own tent um, 
to be away from everybody. And she had her laptop open because she was dating before mentioned uh, possum nosed Ola good guy. Oh. And he had, he had to keep an eye on her at all times. So her laptop was open and in her own private little tent that was made in the back. And it's just shit like that that doesn't um, sit well with the rest of the locker room. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's this holier than thou attitude. And it's like, look, like you ended up on like an online calendar. So it's not like you were even in a magazine actual publication like don't don't think so highly of yourself here i remember there's the same couple that we speak of i did a show in new jersey for pat buck right yeah and then after the show there was like a little after party thing in the bar where we just had a couple beers and food but as soon as said girlfriend saw a picture online of him out they rang up the phone and like cutting a promo on him like dude i cannot have a relationship like that like Just, i am so grateful to having the relationship i have with my wife to where we we've gone like a week without talking to each other but the, the trust factor is there right that you know what i mean like i'm so blessed i could not have a relationship like that at all i don't know some guys like to have their balls in a vice grip i don't know right is that mean like that 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 shows that they they love and they care that the fact that they're fucking always calling you to make sure you're not doing anything wrong i would check it up to just crippling insecurity insecurity yeah see i can't be with that that no fuck no god no 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 i've got another story about said person um <laughs> not like they, they they shall not be spoken of they're not worth even mentioning yeah, this was going to be a johnny ace episode but we're going all over the place um <laughs> so after a certain loved one decided to move on with a rated r superstar there was a story that came out that that's rated r superstar's tires got slashed yes Apparently, v1, In south carolina Apparently, V1 got one of his friends to do it. And when they when he was confronted, he said it was nothing to do with me. He'd done it on his own accord, but put two and two together. And we're talking about an absolute coward. Fake tough guys. They litter the business. I mean, they're everywhere. Fake tough guys. Um, yeah, one I, just got kicked I, out of Japan, too. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, starting next week, if you enjoyed today's episode, you're going to get this every week. We're going to re- review a little bit of wrestling as much as we possibly can. But my friend Paul London and Rene Dupree have returned, they're reunited, and it's for your entertainment. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, it's hopefully you'll get something out of it. You'll walk away with a refreshed kind of mindset and, uh, and, you know, you're, you should have high standards. You should have high standards for what you're watching because time yes. is valuable. Time is not guaranteed to any of us. That's right. And if you're spending upwards of three to nine hours a week watching this stuff, you should have high standards and you should expect good storytelling and good technique. You should expect good matches. Is, right. is that too much to ask for? I don't think so. A great name for you, by the way. And it's in honor of the late great landscape, Texas Napoleons. Texas Napoleons. I never heard that before. Well, yeah, when we were in Hustle, uh, they, me and Lance Cade tagged together and they called us the Texas Napoleons. But in reality, Lance was from Omaha. You're actually right. from Texas. Yeah. And they, call me, they call me the Napoleon from hell because I'm, you know, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, right? Right. It's French and all that bullshit. So, yeah. I don't know. Let's, you know what? Let's do this. Let's let the fans come up with the name of the show. How about that? (laughs) How about that? Yeah, this this should be good. (laughs) This should be good. Let's let the fans decide. (laughs) Yeah. All right. uh, We have a few announcements to make. I mean, uh, it's our guest next week. Is this, this is the part we talk about our guest next week? Yes. So, yeah, so go ahead. Do you want to do it with me? 
you go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. So another great guest for next week. Uh, someone who's been very open about his own addiction problems. Uh, someone we do speak about a lot on the show. And uh, someone that was involved in the main event scene quite a lot with as a manager, uh, Ricardo Rodriguez. Uh, some great stories. Like I said, opens up about his addiction problems. Talks about breaking into the business. Uh, being paired up with Alberto. The main event raw and run. And... I think he had Bret Hart's last ever match on WWE, so, yeah. No way. Wow. Good dude. So, great accomplishment. But, yeah, please, everyone, tune in next Monday. And, yeah, uh, thanks, for everyone. Please hit subscribe, like, share, comment, uh, tell the word. And, yeah, tune in next week for the Texas Napoleons, London friends, <laughs> Renee and Paul. We're working on it, but be sure you tune in for it. Merci, tout le monde. Bonsoir. À la prochaine.